Welcome to lecture six. This lecture, we're going to talk about the Schrodinger factorization method. This is a method that you probably have never seen before. It generalizes the abstract operator method that you use for the simple harmonic oscillator to all other exactly solvable problems. It's very interesting that 14 years after Schrodinger determined the wave equation, he came up with this factorization method. So it was in 1940 and 1941 that he worked on this problem. And he was in Ireland at the time, escaping the Nazis from World War II. And he did this work at the University of Dublin, and it was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science for Ireland. Now, what I want to explain is there's one caveat about this approach, which is that we cannot yet generalize this approach to solve any problem using a computer. And I actually view this as an exciting new opportunity in a field that we thought we knew everything of. And I think it it's remains an unsolved problem and one that I hope to get to work on uh, at some point in the future. Now, the main thing that I want to convey about this is this technique is the easy and quick way to find the energy eigenvalues of the problem without needing to find the wave functions. So when you learn about the Schrodinger equation, you learn about boundary conditions and everything like that. And you have to find the wave function in order to find the energy eigenvalues. Turns out that's not true. You can actually get the energy eigenvalues without finding the wave functions using the factorization method for all solvable problems. And indeed, it's this advantage that you get of being able to find the energy eigenvalues without finding the wave functions, which is why I'm excited to share this technique with you. So it's going to be easiest to jump into the method. You're going to find it quite abstract at first. And we're going to make it concrete by looking at some specific problems that we can solve. I'm also going to give it to you in a rather formulaic way at first. And I find that it's just easiest to look at it this way by just jumping into the water and seeing how things work. So our strategy is we want to solve the energy eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian H, which I'm going to call H sub 0. The 0 does not indicate that it's a unperturbed problem. That's my full Hamiltonian I'm going to be working on. And what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite that Hamiltonian in terms of a a0 dagger plus a times a0 plus an e0. Now, since a0 dagger a0 is a positive semi-definite operator, and what we mean by that is if I look at an expectation value of psi with an operator, you know, make a sandwich with a broquette sandwich with an a0 dagger a0 in between it, that is the same as the norm of the state a0 psi. And because the norm is always a non-negative number, it is 0 if the vector is 0. Otherwise, it's positive. We call A0 dagger A0 a positive semi-definite operator. And that means that the lowest expectation value that A0 dagger A0 can have is 0. And that occurs when the A0 operator acting on the state phi 0 is equal to 0. And that state will be the lowest energy. That will be the ground state. And then because the A0 operator annihilates the state, the energy is just E0. Now, if you look back at how we did this with the simple harmonic oscillator, that's exactly the condition we used on the simple harmonic oscillator. But now, with the standard Schrodinger factorization method, to get the next energy level beyond the ground state, we have to construct a new auxiliary Hamiltonian the set of Hamiltonians we're going to call Hj, and there'll be a set of auxiliary ground states, phi j. And we use the following procedure. We're going to write H1 as A dagger 1, A1 plus E1. H2 is A dagger 2, A2 plus H2. Hj will be A dagger j, Aj plus Ej. And they're going to have Aj acting on phi j equals 0, so that Hj acting on phi j is equal to Ej multiplied by phi j. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. There should be a phi j ket in that line. I will fix that in the notes that I give you. Now, at this point, it does seem like an exercise in futility because I didn't tell you how do we construct the h i's with i bigger than 1. But we do it from the following requirement. We let h j equal a j minus 1 a j 
minus one dagger plus ej minus one, which means h1 is equal to a0, a0 dagger plus e0. Now I know a0 and I know e0 from my first factorization of the Hamiltonian. So I know everything in there, I can construct what the h1 is. I then have to figure out that h1 will in general have a different potential than the h0 had. We call the h1 the first auxiliary Hamiltonian. It will have a new potential. The auxiliary potential will be different from the original potential. And I have to figure out how do I factorize in a standard way as an a1 dagger a1 plus e1 that new Hamiltonian, that new auxiliary Hamiltonian. And by proceeding in turn, that is how we make this procedure work. Okay, so the chain goes as follows. We start with an H, which is H0, A0, dagger A0 plus E0. We form the H1 from A0, A0, dagger plus E0. And then we refactorize that into an A1, dagger A1 plus E1. And then we form an H2 as an A1, A1, dagger plus E1. And then we find a refactorization as an A2, dagger A2 plus E2, and so on. Now we're going to require that ej plus one is greater than ej. We're actually gonna be able to prove that this is the case. That's gonna be a homework problem for you. It may sound to you that that is odd, but what that does is it forbids us from choosing e1 equals e0 and a1 dagger equals a0. You see, if I chose a1 dagger equals a0 on that second line, I would already have my factorization into a1 dagger a1 plus e1 but that factorization is not allowed. And we have to find a factorization that does not work in that way. And because of that, what we're gonna find is that the EJs form a strictly increasing sequence when this method works, okay? So the situation is complicated here. Not only do we have to find a way to factorize the original H, but we have to then find a way to factorize all of these new auxiliary Hamiltonians that we're gonna be creating which have different potentials than the original H had. In fact, the relationship between the H1 and the H0 comes from this commutator of A0 with A0 dagger, okay? And we have to figure out how do we factorize that H1. So it sounds like this is gonna be hard, but it turns out for all exactly solvable problems, there's a simple strategy we can use to solve and factorize all of them. Okay, so for the moment, I want you to think abstractly and assume that we can work out these different factorizations. And let's investigate what the consequences are if we can do that. So let's assume now that psi is an eigenstate of H with eigenvalue E, hence H psi equals E psi. We want to first work out what we call an intertwining identity, which says that if I have HJ plus one acting on AJ, it becomes AJ times hj for the auxiliary Hamiltonians. And the proof is simply by construction. I'm gonna take my hj plus one acting on my aj. I'm gonna write in what hj plus one is. It's equal to a dagger j plus one, aj plus ej plus one. That's just the definition. I can rewrite that as aj, aj dagger plus ej because that is also what hj plus one equals. I'm gonna now move my aj into the parenthesis and I'm gonna get rid of the parenthesis and write it as aj aj dagger aj plus aj ej and now i'm going to factor out an aj from the left hand side and i have an aj aj dagger aj plus ej but aj dagger aj plus ej that's just hj so you see we have just verified this so-called intertwining relationship that if i move an aj through an hj plus one it becomes an hj all right so now Let's consider the set of states that are defined via phi j plus one is equal to aj, aj minus one, a one, a zero acting on psi. So I'm gonna just take a string of these different a operators. Remember we form this chain so we know all of these different a operators. And I just wanna compute the overlap of phi j plus one on phi j. We know that that's the norm of a state so it must be greater than or equal to zero and now what we're gonna do is we're gonna evaluate it using this intertwining relationship. Let's start with j equals one. That means that my state phi one is just a zero acting on psi. So when I look at phi one, phi one, it's just psi a zero dagger a zero psi. But a zero dagger a zero, that's just h minus e zero. And now when h acts on psi, it gives me e. 
So that's equal to E minus E zero. And we know that that's greater than or equal to zero. So that tells me that the eigenstate psi must have an energy that is larger or equal to the ground state energy. Well, you might be saying, duh, of course, it must be greater than or equal to the ground state energy. But that's an interesting thing that we've learned from this procedure. Let's look at the next one. Let's look at phi two. For phi two, if I look at the innermost term, I have an A1 dagger A1. Well, I can write that as H1 minus E1. And now the E1 just moves through the A0 because it's a number. The H1, I use intertwining. H1, A1 is equal to A0, H0. So when I move the H1 through the A0, it becomes H0. But now H0, psi is an eigenstate of H0. So I can replace that by E. So I'm going to get E minus E2 times, I'm sorry, that's a typo of that. It should be E minus E2. Uh, I'm sorry, E minus E1. I don't know how an E2 got in there. Uh, that's a typo. I will fix that for you. It should be H0 minus E1 because the E1 moves through and the number. And so I get an E minus E1. And now when I look at the A0 dagger A0, we just figured out what that one was. That was E minus E1. So I get E minus E1 times E minus E0. That must be greater than or equal to zero. That means either E is equal to E0, E is equal to E1, or E is greater than E1 because E cannot be between E0 and E1. And continuing in this fashion, we find that E is either equal to Ej or E is e lar larger than the largest energy that I have in my factorization chain, which can occur when the factorization chain terminates with just a finite number of states and has a continuum of states above that. That happens for some potentials like the Morse potential or other potentials that you probably haven't heard of. It doesn't quite, it sort of happens with the Coulomb problem, but in the Coulomb problem, there's an infinite number of bound states. So it, I will have an infinite number of these terms, and then I have to actually go beyond that infinite number to get to the continuum states of the Coulomb problem, which are states that normally aren't covered in any of the standard quantum curriculum that we give at either the undergraduate or the graduate level. All right, so that means that we should assume that psi is equal to psi j, which is a bound state that has an energy E equals Ej, because for the moment I'm going to assume it's not a continuum state. And then what we find is phi j plus 1 will overlap with phi j plus 1 is equal to 0, because E is equal to Ej, and then that product of terms is equal to 0. That means that Aj, Aj minus 1, etc., acting on psi is equal to 0. We can rewrite that as aj acting on some phi j is equal to zero, where again, our phi j was defined in the way that we were describing. And so now let's look at what happens when hj acts on phi j. Well, hj is equal to aj dagger aj plus ej. Well, the aj acting on phi j gives zero, so it just will give me ej times phi j. And indeed, that is an energy eigenstate. So the state phi j that we have constructed is indeed an eigenstate of the jth auxiliary Hamiltonian with an eigenvalue ej. Now we're going to construct the normalized eigenstate psi j by looking at a1 dagger, a2 dagger, up to a j minus 1 dagger acting on phi j divided by the square root of the norm of the state, which is ej minus e0, ej minus e1, all the way down to ej minus ej minus 1 and the square root of that so that the state is normalized. I'm just dividing by the norm of the phi j that we had constructed, and I'm adding in all of these different uh, a daggers in there. And it turns out this will be the normalized state. Now, let's take the Hermitian conjugate of the intertwining relation. We found that aj hj was equal to hj plus 1 hj. If I take the Hermitian conjugate, the first term goes to hj aj dagger and i'm going to put that on the right hand side now because eight the hamiltonians are all hermitian and the right hand side is going to go to aj dagger hj plus one remember when i take the hermitian conjugate of a product of operators i have to invert the order of the operators so that goes to me an aj dagger hj plus one which i'm going to put on the left hand side so now what we're going to do is we're going to act our Hamiltonian on the side J. And my claim is that that's going to be an eigenstate. So H0, A0 dagger, I use intertwining. I move it through, it becomes H1. And then I have H1 with an A dagger. I move that through, that becomes H2. And you can see it's perfectly primed so that every time that H uh, 
that auxiliary Hamiltonian is sitting next to the right A dagger so that I can use intertwining to move it through. And in the end, I'll have HJ acting on phi J, but we know HJ acting on phi J just gives me EJ times phi J. I can move that EJ out because it's a number and you see that H acting on psi J gives me EJ times psi J. So the state that we have constructed is an eigenstate of the original Hamiltonian, just as we had claimed. And these are the excited states of the Hamiltonian. So how do we make this work? We have to come up with a way of finding these operators for the factorization. So we're gonna work just like with the factorization for the simple harmonic oscillator. I'm gonna take a P hat over the square root of two M minus I H bar over square root of two M times K J, that's a number. WJ, that's a function we're gonna call a super potential times a KJ prime times an X hat. KJ and KJ prime are wave numbers. They have dimensions of one over length. The KJ out in front, make sure that that term has a dimension of momentum divided by square root of mass, which is the dimension of these A operators. And the WJ, the K prime in there is to make sure that the WJ is a, dimension, a function of a dimensionless argument. Wj of kj prime x hat is called the superpotential. It's a real valued function of kj prime x hat. The ki, or uh, the kj and kj primes are real wave vectors, wave vectors in quotes. There's not really a wave that they correspond to, but they're real numbers with dimensions of one over length. All right, so using this ansatz for aj, let's calculate aj dagger aj. The first term with the AJ dagger, AJ is gonna give me a P squared over 2M. I'm then gonna get a cross term, which is gonna give me an H bar squared. I'm sorry, I'm gonna then get the square of the second term. The A dagger has a plus sign rather than a minus sign. So I'm gonna get H bar squared KJ squared over 2M times WJ squared KJ prime X hat. I'm using the fact that WJ is a real valued function and that X is a Hermitian operator. So that WJ dagger is just WJ of kj prime x hat. In other words, wj is a Hermitian operator in my quantum mechanical Hilbert space. And then I have the cross terms. And because I'm starting with a p dagger, I mean, from an a dagger, I'm gonna take the p over square root of 2m and multiply it by that minus i h bar over square root of 2m wj. So I have the p to the left of the wj. And then when you look at the cross term with the A dagger that has the plus I H bar KJ WJ that multiplies the P from the A operator, you see that appears on the right. It has a minus sign in front of it. Uh, I'm sorry, it has a net of a plus sign, but that has a minus sign. It has a different sign than the other term had. So the net effect is that I actually get a minus I H bar over 2M KJ times the commutator of PJ with the super potential. Okay, so if, so now that has to equal P squared over 2M plus V of X plus some constant, okay? So if I can find a W such that V of X is equal to H bar squared KJ over 2M WJ squared of KJ prime X at minus I H bar KJ over 2M commutator of PJ with the super potential plus some number, then we will have our first factorization. Now, it turns out that solvable potentials always have super potentials that have the same functional form for every superpotential W sub J. And when that occurs, that property is called shape invariance, and it's best illustrated with an example, okay? Now, there often is an ambiguity in how we pick the proper factorization, the function that will work. And what we need is we need K times the superpotential to be larger than zero as X approaches plus infinity, and to be less than zero as x approaches minus infinity. Otherwise, the wave function will turn out not to be normalizable. So we're gonna work out an example that we already know, the simple harmonic oscillator. In this case, V of x is one half m omega squared x squared. Now take a look at what the V is coming from. W squared minus a commutator of P with W, and I have to get the potential up to a constant. Well now, if I pick my w to be proportional to x, the w squared gives me x squared, and the commutator of p with x is a number. So obviously that's gonna be the right solution to pick the w to be proportional to x, okay? So we're gonna pick the w to be some k0 prime times x hat, okay? 
then what I need is one half m omega squared x squared is equal to h bar squared k1 squared k0 prime squared over 2m x squared minus i h bar k0 over 2m times the commutator of p with k0 prime x hat, which is minus i h bar k0 prime plus this energy E0, okay? So you can see I have two coefficients. I have an X squared term and I have a constant term. We make the coefficient of the X squared term equal to M omega zero squared. That means that M omega zero must equal H bar K zero, K zero prime absolute value. And we must have E zero equals H bar squared K zero, K zero prime over two M. Now remember, we have to have k0, w0 to be positive as x goes to plus infinity. That means we must pick k0, k0 prime to be m omega 0 over h bar. So let's do that. That means that a1, I'm sorry, that should be a0, is p over square root of 2m minus i h bar over square root of 2m, m omega 0 over h bar x hat. And I can factor out the square root of 2m. I get 1 over square root of 2m p minus i m omega 0 x hat. The same as what we had gotten before. All right. Now let's commute, compute h1. Remember, h1 is a0, a0 dagger plus e0. So I write that out. It's 1 over 2m p hat minus i m omega 0 x hat p hat plus i m omega 0 x hat plus 1 half h bar omega 0. I'm going to get a p squared over 2m. I'm going to get a 1 half m omega 0 squared x squared. I'm going to get a 1 over 2m with a plus sign now, i m omega 0, commutator of p hat with x hat, that commut plus the 1 half h bar omega 0, commutator of p hat with x hat is minus i h bar. You see that's going to, when all the dust settles, that's going to give me a plus h bar omega 0. And I'm going to get p squared over 2m plus 1 half m omega 0 squared x hat squared plus three halves h bar omega zero. That tells me that my V1 auxiliary is one half m omega zero squared x squared plus h bar omega zero. And that tells me that I can take my A1 to be my A, the same as A0 and my E1 to be three halves h bar omega zero. Okay. Note that this is the only example that I'm aware of where the AJ is independent of J. And one can see that by repeating this procedure, we're going to get the whole spectrum. And in every case, the AJ is going to be equal to the A0. But what is happening is my V auxiliary is increasing by H bar omega 0 each time. The eigenstates are going to agree with what we had before because it's going to just be, you know, remember it's A0 dagger, A1 dagger, A2 dagger, et cetera, out to AJ dagger acting on the phi J. But of course, all of those A's are just equal to A0, so that's going to be A0 to the N. And all of the phi J's are all defined in the same way with A hat acting on uh, phi J is equal to zero, so they're all the same ground state. So everything's going to work out exactly the same as we did before with our solution to the simple harmonic oscillator, okay? Now we're going to do a non-trivial problem. We're going to do a particle in a box. This problem is actually pretty complicated. Particle in box is one of the harder problems to solve in this method. Schrodinger called it shooting sparrows with artillery. Let's consider what particle in a box is. Well, V of X is equal to zero inside the box, which I'm going to take to run from minus L over two to L over two. And I first want you to remember that when I look at the commutator of P hat with F of X, that's equal to minus I H bar F prime of X. So the commutator of p hat with the tangent k prime of x hat is just minus i h bar k prime secant squared k prime x hat. So let's go ahead and examine h bar squared k squared over 2m w squared k prime x hat minus i h bar k over 2m p hat w of k prime x hat for w equals tangent. Okay. So what am I doing? I know what the solution is. I'm I'm essentially plugging in what the solution is and helping you figure it out. If you want to ask yourself, well, how in the world could I figure this out? This is all coming from the fact that tangent squared plus uh, tangent squared minus secant squared is, let's see, let me make sure I get it right. 
tangent squared minus secant squared is minus 1. Okay, that identity, tangent squared minus secant squared is minus 1. You see, that's an identity that I need because I need my potential, which I'm getting from w squared. See, that's going to be the tangent squared, and the commutator is going to be my secant squared. If I get the sign right, that's going to equal a number, a constant. And of course, that's good enough for me to get the potential equals zero because I need to get the potential plus a constant. So this is the origin of where this is coming from. Okay, so when we plug that in, we do indeed get h bar squared k squared over 2m tangent squared minus h bar squared kk prime over 2m secant squared. And now we have to work on making sure we can get this to work to give us the right answer. If we choose k equals k prime, then I'm going to get tangent squared k prime x minus secant squared k prime x, which is just equal to minus 1, and that is a number. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose a1 is 1 over square root of 2m p hat minus i h bar k prime tangent k prime x hat. That gives me, when I calculate a1 dagger a1, I get 1 over 2m p squared minus h bar squared k prime squared over 2m. So e1 is going to equal h bar squared k prime squared over 2m. And now I have to choose k prime appropriately. What we're going to do is we're going to pick the first k prime that makes w of k prime x become infinity at the boundary. You might ask, why am I doing that? Well, I haven't shown it to you yet. We're going to develop this. I believe you're probably going to develop it in a homework problem. But it turns out that when the potential, when the wave function is equal to zero, the superpotential is infinity. It turns out we can write the superpotential as minus the derivative of the wave function divided by the wave function, which tells us that when the wave function is zero, because the derivative can't be zero at the same time, the superpotential is infinity at that point. And we know that we want the wave function of the particle in a box to be zero at the boundary of the box. So I'm going to choose my k prime such that the w has an infinity at the boundary. And we, so that means we can take the k prime equals pi over L. And I'm going to show you how we can now generalize this to solve for the excited states as well. So what we learn from this is that the ground state energy is h bar squared pi squared over 2 ml squared. And indeed, that is the ground state energy of the particle in a box that you're familiar with. Now, the way that we get the wave function is p hat minus i h bar pi over L tangent pi over L x hat acting on the state is equal to zero. In coordinate space, I can write that as minus i h bar d by dx psi of x is equal to i h bar pi over l tangent pi over l x is times psi of x. And if I divide both sides by psi of x, you see I get d by dx log psi of x is equal to minus pi over l tangent pi over x. I can integrate both sides. I get log psi of x is pi over l to any derivative of tangent. Well, the any derivative of tangent is minus log secant. But minus log secant, if I take the exponential of that, it, that is just equal to cosine times a constant. And normalization is going to, be, going to give me the constant is square root of 2 over L. So we get that psi over x is square root of 2 over L cosine pi over Lx. And that's it. We've solved the problem. So that's pretty cool. Now, to get the higher energy states, I have to write my H1 as A0, A0 dagger plus E0. I can write that as h0 plus the commutator of a0 with a0 dagger. Remember, my v of x is equal to 0, and I get the commutator of, um, that should be a0 with a0 dagger. Uh, I'm sorry, that's a typo there with the a1. I will get that corrected. Uh, you work out that commutator. It's i h bar pi over 2 ml commutator of p with tangent, but we know commutator of p with tangent is going to be secant squared. There's a factor of 2 that comes out as well when we work out that commutator. Just look carefully at the a and the a dagger. You'll see there are two contributions of commutators of p with tangent. And I'm going to rewrite that secant squared using our identity as 1 plus tangent squared pi over l x hat. You'll see why I do that in just a moment. OK? So that means the v of x, we can read it off, it is equal to h bar squared pi squared over ml squared tangent squared pi l over x hat plus h bar squared pi squared over ml squared. That is the um, that is v1 of x.
And I need to rewrite that as h bar squared k1 over 2m w1 squared k1 prime x plus i h bar k1 over 2m commutator of p with w1 of k1 prime x plus e1. The shape and variance requirement tells us, well, let's just try tangent of k1 prime x hat. Let's plug in. So I'm, of course, going to get a tangent squared from the w1 squared. I'll get a secant squared from the commutator. And what you see if I rewrite that secant squared in terms of the identity with the tangent squared, I'm going to get h bar squared k1 k1 prime over 2m, that's the constant term, plus h bar squared k1 over 2m k1 plus k1 prime tangent squared of k1 prime x hat. Now, if we continue to have k1 prime equals pi over l, and this is the way that Schrodinger solved the problem, he said fix the k1 prime to the same value that it had before, then you can see k1 times k1 plus k1 prime must equal 2 pi squared over l squared. If I substitute in k1 prime equals pi over l, that gives me a quadratic equation for the k1. And the quadratic equation is solved by k1 equals pi over l or k1 is equal to minus 2 pi over l. I have to decide on which one to pick. Well, it turns out if I pick k1 equals pi over l, that's the same as picking a0 equals a1 dagger. So I can't do that. I'm sorry, a1 equals a0 dagger. That was the one rule that we couldn't do. So I can't pick that solution. I have to pick the minus 2 pi over l. And then when we look at the constant terms, we find this formula, h bar squared pi squared over ml squared equals h bar squared k1 k1 prime over 2m plus e1 for the energy e1. Okay, so we have to pick k1 equals minus 2 pi over L in order to not have A0 dagger equals A1. It also is a requirement for E1 to be bigger than E0. And so that tells us that the E1 is 2 h bar squared pi squared over ML squared, and that our A1 is 1 over square root of 2 m p hat minus i h bar 2 pi over L tangent pi x over l, we can now find the wave function. a1 multiplying phi 1 is equal to 0. That's the equation that we solved before. It's this, I'm sorry, it's very close to the equation that we solved before. Because the coefficient in the superpotential is a factor of 2 bigger, it has an extra factor of 2 in it. And what that's going to give us is that when we integrate it, we're going to get c times cosine squared pi x over l. And again, we can normalize that. It turns out the normalization constant, if I have a cosine squared, is 8 over 3l. And then to get the wave, so that's the auxiliary Hamiltonian ground state of the first auxiliary Hamiltonian. In order to get our wave function, I have to apply a0 dagger divided by square root of e1 minus e0 to that phi 1. That is a differential operator that I have to apply so let's go ahead and put in the constants, the square root of 8 over 3L, that's the C prime, 1 over square root of 4 minus 1 H bar squared pi squared over 2M L squared, that's the square root of E1 minus E0. The A0 dagger is 1 over square root of 2M minus I H bar D by DX, that's the P hat, plus, because it's dagger, I H bar pi over L, it's A0, so there's no 2 there, tangent pi X over L acting on this cosine squared pi x over l. So you go ahead and take the derivative of the cosine squared. You get a 2 cosine times a sine. You take the cosine squared, multiply it by the tangent. You get a cosine times a sine. When all the dust settles, you find that that cosine times a sine, you can use the double angle formula to get it into just a sine of twice the argument. And you find you get square root of 2 over L times I. There's an overall factor of I times sine 2 pi X over L, which is, again, our first excited state. It has a factor of I in it, but that's an overall global phase. And so it is giving us the correct first excited state of the particle in a box, which is the odd function sine 2 pi X over L times its normalization constant, which continues to be square root of 2 over L. Now, one can... can one can continue doing this, but you can see it gets very tedious. And you can use an induction-like approach to fairly easily find that kj is equal to minus j plus 1 pi over l. kj prime continues to be pi over l. 
ej is equal to h bar squared j plus 1 squared pi squared over 2m l squared and psi j of x is square root of 2 over l sine j plus 1 pi x over l just as we knew from the differential equation approach but it is rather tedious to do it this way so you might ask the question well why should i do this approach if it's harder well i have two points to say about this first off most problems are not as hard as particle in a box. So don't be fooled into thinking particle in a box is always the simplest problem to solve in quantum mechanics. It's actually a fairly hard problem. And the more you learn about quantum mechanics in Hilbert space, the more you appreciate that the solution of the particle in a box is really actually a pretty hard problem that has a lot of subtle issues associated with it. So it isn't always hard, or indeed for most of the other problems we're going to look at, it is easier, and in many cases much easier, especially if all I care about is getting the energies. And the second thing is it provides a new perspective in the way in which we work with quantum mechanics, because you see, everything that we did here really came just from the fact that the commutator of x with p is ih bar. That's really the only fact that we used in everything that we did. That plus the fact that the norm of a vector is always bigger than or equal to zero and the only state that has a norm that's equal to zero is the zero vector those are the only things that we used in deriving this approach okay that brings us now to the end of lecture six and we'll see you next time in lecture seven